kind of reminded that perhaps this is not the best time to do the meetup at this close to the madness of everything. But anyways, it's always good to see you. We didn't have a last month because of our, our incredible speakers that were there. We had, let's see, well, Derek, where's Derek, you, and okay. we had, I think it was, was there a third that came? Is anyone yeah, a first timer? Greg's boss was there. I'm a first timer. First timer. What's yeah. your name? First timer. Tom McCullough. Tom McCullough. Tom McCullough. First timer. You've been here, right? Yeah. Where are you? What? Uh, what do you? Moral work? Solutions in West Valley City, and I'm a product manager for our infrastructure group. So we're standing up uh, Kubernetes for about 50 different Motorola products throughout the company. Still. Still. I thought you guys were doing that. I touched Motorola guy. Years ago, when you were in the process of doing part in that, yeah, well, one Motorola group. Oh, well, no, <laughs> in West Valley, though, like it's but we're okay. still doing it. I okay. mean, we're continuing to build that infrastructure at identity and audit and observability logging. Sure, uh, I look after the SRE function and I look after the, the tooling group. Cool, and so yeah, fun. and as a product person over that group, you must be pretty technical. So I went to school for computer science, but okay. a long time there ago. You but yeah. you should be a technical person. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, it's a, we're, we struggle with that a little bit here. I'm like, who product owns that? And right now it's another engineer. They, <laughs> they were, when they found me, they were looking for somebody who had that capability, but also enjoyed talking with partners around the world. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, that's kind of what I've been doing. That's cool. Yeah. Well, welcome. Thank you. You have, if, you, if you're not already on there, we have a Slack channel. At, Actually, Slack channel. That's a Slack. Slack, Slack, uh, Slack group or group community like that. Um, That's the only. Or Utah, and so we have Kubernetes. It's one of the sub channels. A lot of talk on there. Good. Super. Actually, so please. Welcome in. Thank you. I think we still have it on the uh, Utah Kubernetes meetup. It's on the meetup page. On the home of the meetup page up. is where the link is. Workspace. Okay. This is what Slack is. the correct uh, link. So workspace. They call it a workspace. Well, welcome. Community. That's a official <laughs> Okay, sorry. Community. That's a site. Can, can we do this afterwards? <laughs> <laughs> Invite out. So a little bit later. Glad you're a little bit separate. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, good to have you all here. And let's see. I also didn't have a printer to print off the jet frames. Oh, Free things. I actually have two oh, this month. They two up, printers. They upgraded you. Huh? Two printers? Are they not oh, it's, or? From, wait, it's from last month. <laughs> it's a, it's a line printer. I'm going to have like five <laughs> when I get the raffle working again. What was that? Oh, I'll share our raffle stuff with you. We have an auto raffle. Thing. Well, do you want to? No, it's not working. I have to fix it. <laughs> Okay. And that's not his fault, though, right? Every engineer is going to run. Wait, wait. No. I just want to make sure. I explain later why it's broken, but. I just want to make sure we're not playing. It's our raffle. Okay. But, anyways, um, I have two tonight. One that needs to be. It's a good babysitter. Claimed, redeemed by next Smack Week. So. Uh, they expire. Yeah, they, they do expire. expire at the end of the year. Well, no. The ones I have actually, they, they give me for a, like a month or two in advance, and then because we weren't here last month, and there's a December 29th, I, I have some sort of got it. Okay. Please redeem it if you if you get it, because then they'll continue to send some more. So, anyways, we'll do that little wrap. And you're gonna have to, I'm gonna have to have your email address, and I'll send you the cert certificate. So who who actually had it before? Was that you? I remember you, and you got one, right? I got one. And you got one too. Okay. So we got a lot of regulars today. I know it's good. We ought to get from everyone. Everyone, everyone gets a job. Right. Anyways, thank you again for Weave hosting it. For the food, it's always wonderful to, to be here. And I think we get more Weave people here than than, uh, than anyone else, which is great. It's because they we we a lot of us are Weave people went to Weave. They started here. Yeah, I, I know say, they hit their regulars before they. I know. I know. I know. It kind of was. It was. We get yeah. the other. Anyways, it's good to have Jordan here. Um, I can give you a lot of wonderful stories um, about him and his uh, incredible expertise. We worked together at Ancestry. Um, we were in on the ground floor of, of bringing Kubernetes to Ancestry. So let's be honest. No, I mean, but but he was a key component, just amazing what he did for us and uh, at Ancestry. 
He works for Microsoft now and very involved in Kubernetes still and as well as other cloud technologies. Um, he's just a master of everything and so this is, this is good to have him here. So Way too much. Uh, no, I, he's just, he's just amazing. <laughs> Before we begin and have Jordan come up, um, any jobs or any announcements that you would like to bring to the, the group at this time? I know that Anyone, <laughs> anyone yeah. not hiring? <laughs> yeah, who's not who's not hiring? Raise their hand. Or who's looking? <laughs> who's looking? Josh. <laughs> <laughs> you can talk to us afterwards. <laughs> but anyways, um, hey, so we're always hiring at Microsoft. There you go. Um, there's roles on the AKS team. You'd have to move to Boulder or Seattle. Um, wow. You want to do take on that big uh, jump? Yes, guys, or Boulder. Um, but there's yeah, just. Throwing that out there. Oh, please. Yeah, wonderful. Well, as we get to the end of the year, it's always good to look back. We've had some good meetups. and appreciate your, your attendance, also your presenting, and looking forward to continuing that next year. We have um, something in February, no, January, and another one that's potentially in February. Um, if you have some other topics, or if we want to do some other things, let me know. I'd like to continue this this thing going. Super. That. Jordan, check off. Jordan. Yeah. I've got some team socks guys, uh, that I'm going to be. Oh, yeah, yeah. I know everybody's yes. dying for a pair of team socks. So. Which team? Yeah. Microsoft team. Oh. Wow. Here's the, okay, good. I just um, upgraded to a Surface. So this is, it was a big move for me. I've been on a Mac for years and they didn't require, they didn't require me to do that, but I did it. And if you notice the laptop three looks a lot like a Mac. I don't know if you noticed that, but it's actually been a pretty good experience so far. A little different, but uh, pretty good. So um, like Paul said, uh, he gives way too much credit. Paul really did a lot of that work over at Ancestry. I just kind of tagged along for the journey, but learned a lot. Um, with Microsoft, been there about three years. I know most of you, nice talk at KubeCon. Derek's was good, not, not as good. <laughs> oh, for certain <laughs> reasons, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just joking. Derek's was great. Derek's actually like, he got so many laughs. Oh, that talk. He did. It's on a great story. He did a great job. Yeah. It, the whole AKS part. <laughs> was your whole team there? But it was young. What's that? Was your whole team there? No, no, I just uh, saw it posted in the Slack channel. Uh, okay. <laughs> oh, ah. <laughs> it was good. Uh, so about three years. Unfortunately, I don't focus on Kubernetes as a full time. I wish I did. Um, I focus on network storage, compute, virtual desktops, really anything in the Azure space I try to cover. It's pretty much impossible to do that. Um, so we have lots of experts behind me. So I've tried to stay pretty close on the Kubernetes part of what's going on, what we're pushing. Uh, I have a, probably about 30, 40 minutes worth of content. Um, at the end, I did want to mention a couple of open source projects that were just announced <coughs> but, uh, at our conference in um, Orlando called Ignite. And you'll see more of those at our build conference in February. But uh, the topic tonight is the virtual cubelet. Has anybody heard of, of it? Okay. Few, a few of you. Does anybody use it in one cloud provider or another today? Not yet. Okay. It's pretty new, uh, but it is actually G8 in, in AWS today. Uh, but we'll get to that in just a minute. First of all, before we get into it, we'll have to cover a couple set of topics. Um, and really the, the session takeaways that, that I'm hoping that you come away with is what is Azure Container Instances? Uh, you'll learn how that compares kind of to Fargate, which is very similar. I don't know if GCP, does GCP have a container instance? It's called GCP. Yeah, it's GCP. Oh, it's called GCP? You can actually just take it and run it. Okay, so they've had that for a long, a long time then. Okay, yeah. I didn't know that. Um, we'll learn about the virtual kubelet, uh, what it is, how we are implementing that, and how it's, uh, we can connect that um, Kubernetes to other APIs. And then also um, how we're taking ACI and Kubernetes, gluing that together. Sorry, Jordan, I, I should have asked you before, but we are recording this and broad, broadcasting it, I think, as well. I know it that is you, internal. Sorry, yeah, ignore the slides. There, okay, I, I just want to make sure that you're okay with that. that was presented before it was actually okay. supposed to be. So I want to make sure you're, you're yeah. aware of that. I don't get fired from this presentation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
So um, sometimes you just need a container, uh, and that's what we came up with Azure Container Instances for. Um, similar to Fargate, I guess, similar to what, how GKE operates. I'm not, I, I'm probably least familiar with the Google platform than I am with any others, more familiar with AWS and, and Azure. So we, we came up with this concept probably a year, year and a half ago called Azure Container Instances, where we can just take a container and deploy that to Azure and have it, have it run um, your container for you. Good for testing to make sure it works and there's no, no, no bugs in it. You don't have to deal with any VMs. Uh, not, no VMs at all. You never see the VMs in what we call your Azure subscription. You can set, um, there's some scaling limits as far as what we can do there. You can have a single CPU, uh, four CPUs, and then up to 16 gigs of RAM on the, on the four gig, uh, four CPU, uh, 16 gigs of RAM. Um, per second billing, so it's nice for event-driven models. We can have Azure Functions actually call off to Azure Container Instances and spin up Container Instances to do the event-driven programming. Um, and then we can also run Windows and Linux uh, containers within ACI. Um, Windows containers are still, images are still larger than we want. Those are coming down um, as we now deploy uh, node pools, Windows node pools into AKS. We're seeing those images drop and drop just because they have to, because the load times are too, uh, too big. And then also some stuff we're doing um, around um, mounting um, storage to make image load times faster. Um, but that's probably for another, that's for another day. So here's, our, here's some common use cases that we're seeing for um, ACI. Uh, task automation, uh, batch jobs, simple web applications, um, build agents, using that for build agents, CD application, or whatever you use your CID, to interface, it's Azure DevOps or, or GitHub, we're putting more like GitHub tasks if you're leveraging that. We're, we're seeing we're building some of these um, uh, container instances to, to be behind, sit behind that. So, uh, what, one thing I'm not used to with Windows is the constant patching um, <laughs> that I wasn't used to in Mac. So that's been a lot of fun too. Okay, so let me just show you what this looks like. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time, but it's good to know this so you can see how we're how we're implementing the virtual kubelet. So Azure Container Instances. Um, if you simply, let's see, get bigger. Uh, let me just do code and CI group. So this is um, a YAML file. You should all be familiar with these. It's behind ACI sits Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes environment. So we can pick, you know, the, the CPU resources you want. You can obviously pick your image. Um, and then you say whether it's a Windows, um, Windows or Linux uh, ACI container that you're going to spin up, and then you, you pick the type. And then you just deploy that, and then after you deploy that uh, in your Azure subscription, you are left with uh, just a running container. You can go in. There really is not a whole lot to it, um, but you can come in and you can see that you have um, you know, live logs. So this one, um, oh, one thing I forgot to <coughs> Let me just show you this real quick, and I'll, I'll come back to that. So, so one thing you can see from here, there's actually two containers. So you can actually do essentially a pod model or sidecar model within ACI. So I have a simple web application running here, and then I just have a sidecar. All it's doing is like a, a, a head request on that website, making sure that it's alive and running. So anyway, back to container instances. You can, you know, get properties, get the live logs. So this just shows live logs right here within the Azure portal of, of it getting the, and then if it has a shell for some reason, if you have a large, um, large uh, image that has a shell, you can then bash into it or sh into it and kind of get some more information. But again, not a lot. And then we provide some metrics on what it, you know, what the CPU, what the memory, what the network utilization is. So that's, uh, that's ACI, I just want to quickly show you that in the portal. And then this is essentially what we just, what we just looked at. So there's a web application. They're in the, what we call it, we don't call it a pod, we call it a group in Azure Container Instance. So we group them together. Um, 
and then you have kind of this this sidecar model where it's one on the sidecar v ones talking to the app. So that's what we can do. Again, not super advanced, right? Not really meant to be at this point. Um, but a lot of customers are leveraging this. And one of the reasons that they're leveraging this is because it's really easy to get going. One of the one of the things that I hear kind of time and time again, and for a Kubernetes <coughs> meetup, I, I probably won't hear it here, but like customers I'm going into, it's like, man, Kubernetes, there's this, this ramp up time um, that it's like three to six months. So we actually start customers on container instances. We start with them on app services where it's a lot easier to get going. And then the teams, whether it's operations teams, developers, DevOps, SREs, whatever you call it, can kind of make that ramp up because there's a big there's a big learning curve and a big operator. And even at Ancestry, how long it took us quite a while, right? Paul, to get. And I think with managed offerings in the cloud, we've made it easier, but I still think there's almost, and this is kind of what Brendan has echoed as well, Brendan Burns that's with Microsoft now, is there's we need to make it more seamless to get on onto Kubernetes and quit making it so hard and so many components and all these YAML files all over the place. And so how do we do that? So ACI is one of those ways. Uh, the billing is um, per second, like I mentioned. So if you had a, a one core, one gig of RAM, um, it would cost you about a dollar a day to run if you run it 24 hours during that day. Um, and when this service first came out, it was actually quite a bit more expensive than a VM that was of similar size. We've since lowered the price, so the pricing is exactly the same to the core. So what can we actually do in ACI today? We can run Windows and Linux containers. Um, we can scale up to four CPUs and 14 gigs of RAM. That's the largest ACI size. You can expose these on public IPs. You can mount Azure files, so NFS and SMB mounts inside of the, uh, the ACI container. Um, we can pass in secrets and environment variables. And then uh, there's restart policy. The last one that's just the biggest one that a lot of customers are asking is how do we, can we put this inside of a virtual network or AWS or uh, GCP, I think VPC, I think they call it. So now these can actually live in your kind of private network and you don't have to expose them to the public. Okay. So, but what if you needed some of these more advanced things that Kubernetes does offer? And that's things like auto scaling. We can't auto scale ACI today. So if you have a big spike on your web application, ACI might not be a good fit because you might, you know, there. service discovery, advanced network features, and then you know, we can't actually do like block devices. We can't mount a disk instead of one of the pieces and stuff like that off of it. So then you need an orchestrator. And I think uh, you guys know what an orchestrator is. Um, yeah. Is there any newbies to Kubernetes? I feel like there's so many advanced Kubernetes people in here. Is there any newbies to okay, Kubernetes? So um, some of the things that you get with with Kubernetes is the scheduling, the health checks, the scaling, the service discovery, all the things that are listed here that maybe we don't get with ACI. Um, and then just a real high level view of the architecture here, you have, for those that are new, um, you have the master components, you know, that run, that run your um, API server, you have controller management scheduler, etcd, which stores all the information about the cluster. Um, and then you have these worker nodes and the worker nodes are usually, if it can be bare, bare metal if you're on-prem, they're usually VMs um, in the cloud, and then they usually have a number of different binaries that talk to the API servers that make the VM, right? So that's just a high level. Um, and then in Azure, what we do um, is we manage the control plane for you. So the etcd, the API, the controller manager, all of that managed control plane with no cost to you. So we give that for free. I think GCP or Google does that as well. And then a and AWS, and again, I'm not knocking any cloud, but AWS, I believe, charges for that, for that model. We're actually in a roadmap where uh, the problem that we've had with it is there's an SLO with this, a service level objective. Since we, you don't pay for it, we can't set an SLA on that. So we're now actually giving you the ability to pay for those as well and provision that so you get the SLA or you can continue to run it with our with our SLO. Um, and so we take this up the stack where we do all the things for we have logging and monitoring, we have scaling, reliability and uh, keeping it highly available, provisioning upgrades, patches, we patch AKS every night with security updates. If there's one that needs a reboot, we'll alert you and then you can use uh, uh, is that cured, I think is what it's called. 
acute cure D that will uh, kind of cordon and drain everything, move everything off so that the node can be safely rebooted and does that kind of automated way. So that's, uh, that's AKS and how we have built um, the AKS platform. So now you have Kubernetes and you have um, ACI, but what if you also want some of the features that we were just talking about in Azure Container Instances? What if we want the, the fast startup time? Um, what if we want no VMs to manage it all? You don't want to see VMs and deal with VMs. Um, and then the per second billing so you can actually burst and do whatever you need to do. Um, who's using Node Auto Scaler in here to scale up your, your nodes? Five, five of you, okay, six of you. Um, and then who's using the horizontal pod auto scaling with Zoic? Same, same crew, okay. Um, so what we've done and what Brendan's, this really came out of Brendan Burns' vision is that he said, well, let's get away from as much infrastructure. I don't even wanna see VMs in the cluster. I wanna have a managed control plane. So when the customer comes to Azure and they say, I want AKS, they spin it up, they get a managed control plane, no cost, unless you want the other one. Um, and then you don't even want to see VMs at all in your environment, right? It's just don't, don't worry about infrastructure. So he came up uh, initially the name, oh, well, actually I'm not quite that far yet. So the kubelet, anybody want to tell me what the kubelet does before I, anybody? Paul? Its main function is to interact with the, the container runtime elements and then it does other stuff but yeah, that's perfect um, so exactly what Paul said um, registers the node with the API server primary node agent that runs on every VM or node in your cluster responsible for taking the pod spec that's defined in your manifest and meeting making sure that it is delivered how it says it's delivered and then also making sure it's healthy and the number of pods that are three or continue to stay running at that point, okay? So what we've done is, it's gonna ding again, uh, there we go. What we've done is um, instead of uh, having physical nodes or VM nodes as part of the cluster, we've developed what they call the virtual kubelet. That's the open source uh, name of the project. And what it does is it, it masquerades and appears to be a node inside of your Kubernetes cluster. But when actually it can be anything you want it to be on the back end. So they built it to where it's pluggable. So if you needed to have like an IoT based solution, you could have Azure IoT Edge be the back end for a Kubernetes cluster. So you could have that central control plane, but then actually be running pods on Arduinos and Raspberry Pis or whatever on the back end. In our case, uh, we've done that. that. That's actually, we have customers using that today. Um, another one that we have is um, this, and probably the more popular one is this backed by Azure Container Instance that I mentioned in the beginning. So now we have a completely um, managed cluster. You don't manage any of the master components. You don't manage any of the nodes. You don't even see the nodes. You see one node, possibly two. I'll tell you about that in a minute. Yeah, Paul? You may have go into this, but um how does it how does it securely do that in, on the edge? Because <clears throat> the kubelet has all that negotiation as far as its rights to be able to talk to the API server and other things. So right. how, how does that work? And are you going to get into that detail? Um, so it probably work. Um, it kind of depends on where it would be on the edge. Like, um, well, let me let me come back. Okay. Let me come Sorry. Back. <laughs> yeah. So any questions on? Uh, so what this allows us to do is now that we have virtual kubelet Kubernetes cluster, um, we could then somewhat be infinitely scalable, right? Because the only word where it would be non-scalable is you would hit the um, limits of your subscription. So in every subscription or every say account in AWS, you have limits. Um, you would be limited to a soft limit of what we would give you for ACI. Then you want to call us and say we want to run more in Azure. We're happy to extend that to up to a certain part. I'm not sure what that is, but I believe this gives you out of the box uh, 10,000 cores and about 
10 terabytes of RAM that you can use to um, that you can use to scale your cluster. Um, is this what Amazon just announced? Fargate. Yes. Is it, use, is it using virtual cubelet? It's, it's yeah, form yeah, virtual cubelet behind the scenes is what. Yeah. They're actually uh, working with us, which is interesting. Uh, but uh, uh, contributing to this, so you have like um, them, us. Uh, Google, I don't, for some reason, I don't think has been there yet. I don't think they're contributing to the project, but we have um, OpenStack, which I didn't, I thought, I didn't think OpenStack was the thing anymore, uh, but I guess it still is. So they have something called Zoom, which you can, which you can tie into that. Try to, sorry, sorry I think that's the music player. What's that? It's a music player. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's probably a bad name for that project, but. Um, so you think that's because open, uh, Virtual Cubelet is CCF? Right. Uh, yeah, so it's it's in the sand it's in sandbox. Yeah. Yep. So maybe that's why Amazon feels like they can work on it because it's not yeah, yeah. The governance is not right. Amazon or Microsoft governance. Yeah. And actually they're a little bit further ahead than we are. Uh, just to be just to be transparent, they can actually do a nodeless, completely nodeless uh, EKS cluster. We have to have one or two nodes to run what we call the AC I'll show you in a minute, the ACI connector. So uh, anyway, so here's the use cases. The first use case is to again have your managed control plane. And then when you actually hit the limits of uh, when you know HPA needs to kick in, you would burst into Azure Container instances or, or Fargate or whatever. You, know, you could even write your own if you want. It's pluggable to where you could do that. So that's cool. That's <coughs> That's the first uh, use case. The second one uh, is where I, I don't even need a node in the cluster anymore. I don't even need nodes. I can just go straight to uh, straight out to Azure Container Instances. Question about the previous yeah. slide. Yeah. Um, the, the, yeah. <laughs> the networking here, I assume the caveat here is if you're using like Azure native Kubernetes networking where where all your pods, regardless of where they live, are getting IP addresses on your yeah. virtual network. So requirement if you're using an overlay. This, this, this wouldn't work. Right. Requirement of this is to actually use the Azure CNI. Yeah. I mean, that's that's yeah. reasonable. I'm just yeah. No, it's a good it's a good question. Oh, I got it. <laughs> Thank you. Did I do? Did I do? No. <laughs> nope. They're just telling us that they're going to turn off the power if we don't press the button. Lost on a, right a quarter. Did you? And from <laughs> yeah, put a quarter. In. Yes. No, they charge us a lot more than a quarter <laughs> every <laughs> hour. We're at. Yeah. Why do people not always do the second option? What's the main reason that you would want to start new on VMs if it's the same price to just never have a VM? So that's a good question. Um, I I don't. I think um, actually I don't know the answer to that. I actually prefer the second method is just to get rid of VMs completely so you don't have them there. In our case today. We have to run the ACI connector on like two nodes, okay. so we'd have to have there. But because you want to go over your size limits, right? You have to, you could get your own VM and run a giant pod on there. That yeah. wouldn't fit in there. Yeah, yeah well, but it's cheaper to run your own VM. No, he said it's the same price now. Well, if, if you're paying enough money, you still get cheaper if you pay. Mm. So. Right, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> we have to commit the cost to where it's about the same, but uh, I don't know. I'd have to. It probably depends on. Plus, I would assume latency wise. So, if you own the VM and you know the pods and you have the images cached, those start immediately versus you can't guarantee that ever that's right. on a virtual. So, if, yeah, and that's, that's where it comes. Uh, usually, on average, well, I can't even say on average because image sizes vary so much. We usually see about a 20 to 30 second start time with, um, with ACI. And the VM, I don't know what you guys see with the node auto scaler, but you have to spin up the VM, push the images down. I mean, it's usually like five, 10 minutes. I, I, I don't know, I'm guessing there, but. Up to 30 sometimes, I think. Up to 30. <laughs> <laughs> we won't talk about mine. <laughs> Not my mine. Okay, so that's the uh, second use case there. So let me just show you what this looks like. Eric, I was just saying that I, I enjoyed your talk. I don't know why. But, uh, sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> are you really? <laughs> sorry, not sorry. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> sorry, because Jordan is a great person. Yeah. Eric's a great person. 
Okay, so uh, let me just show you how to enable this if you're deploying the cluster um, during the setup in the Azure portal under scale. The only thing you have to do is just hit enable there. Um, this will enable um, Linux based ACI. If you want Windows today, you have to actually do it through the command line. So not, not too big of a deal, but if you forget and um, need to deploy it after, you just do an AZ, AZ AKS uh, install dash connector. And then that will deploy the connector. And then if you want both Windows and Linux, you can take, say, OS type and just both. So uh, after you have it deployed, you, uh, uh, the alias is gone because I restarted this, so I'm just long to wait here. But um, if I just do a kubectl git nodes, you can see that the we call it, so the virtual kubelet is the open source project name. We call it virtual node inside of AKS, Amazon. I don't know what Amazon calls it, whatever they released it. Um, and we try to stay version wise about in between <coughs> the older and the newer, just so we're not too far behind and not too far ahead. So most of the features are going to be compatible. Um, so if I, and if you were on a, just so I make sure I compare my QCTL. What is it? Uh, dash y, you can, oops. You can see that it is, in fact, that pod deployed out to the, the ACI, um, the ACI. So if I, um, if I want to scale this, I'll just do a manual scale. I have a, um, a demo, but it, I, the load generator takes too long, so I kind of scrapped that. So, I have a quick question while we're talking about scale. Yeah. Um, and I've been wondering this for a while with virtual kubelet. What do you do about scheduling? Because you've only got a single node, so obviously all the Kubernetes scheduling primitives are out the door, which is fine. Do you just not? How would you say, I've got five, and I want you to spread those across AZs? Because they end up in AZs <coughs> in Azure somewhere. They have to be on, in a zone. Does it just have some default behavior of trying to spread them? Do you get a, or is there some sort of weird way that you add metadata to a pod that tells the virtual kubelet, like, spread, you know, like that replaces the Kubernetes native scheduling with deeper scheduling. So I think this is done, um, whoops. Oh, <laughs> we'll cancel out of that. Doesn't matter. <laughs> just that your organization is in control. Somebody proposed that. Hold on a minute, sorry. Oh, yeah. Let me get back and then I'll try to answer your question. Yes, I, I've been thinking about this for a long time. I've been doing this and been doing scheduling for a lot, for a while. So. I mean, these are still short lived functions as a service, really, right? No, they're anything. This is normal. It could be anything. It's any box book. Yeah. 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 And so it's. I think it goes down. So like the kubelet has, you have the option of having multiple virtual nodes. Like if you really wanted to go to a different region, that might have to be a different virtual okay. node. Maybe yeah. If you care that much about scheduling, oh, you still use yeah. the Kubernetes schedule. You just don't do a single. And then it gets the same information that so your multiple virtual kubelet. Kubelet. And that's what I think they're working on. Is if you had to have a single control plane, but had these out into different regions, you would. Yeah, you would <clears throat> I don't think that's been. Some of this hasn't been all. I think worked out yet. Yeah. Um, and then the zones, I, I don't know if that's through, I actually, I don't know the answer to that, if that's through annotations or if that's some other method, but yeah, it had probably some future things nature. that we're probably trying to figure out. Yeah. I saw your node and the <laughs> virtual node were on different versions of Kubernetes. Is ACI like hard coded essentially to a specific Kubernetes version or? It's, yeah, to that one that was on, that was listed there. And then when we update when we update that, um, then that would get sort of set up. So we try to stay kind of in the middle just to. So you're not in any control over the ACI version? Correct. Correct. We're kind of controlling that on our side. Yeah. 
So anyway, those came up and they ran. Obviously, my machine didn't start. Um, so it came probably about 30 seconds, maybe 45 seconds. But you can see the power of that, that this, this, the automatic scale in, scale out per second billing, get charged a little bit. And I just, honestly, I, I don't know. I got sick, at least at Ancestry. This is a long time ago, so I know things have improved a lot. But dealing with nodes and VMs and dead VMs and, you know, let's, let's just don't worry about that and just go out to some platform service. So, yeah. Derek? On your resource requests and limits, mm -hmm. how's that managed? And yeah, so it works with HPA. Let me show you, uh, let me actually show you the, the YAML file. <coughs> so I, on this one, I just had a, I gave it a, a core, um, but it honors, it honors that and works with that. So when I hit that, it will scale out to ACI. So that was something that they didn't have initially, and then they've implemented that just recently. And then to actually get this to favor um, uh, to favor the, the virtual kubelet or the virtual node, we add a node selector, so we add some labels to the nodes, and then we also taint the, the virtual kubelet all together because we can't have cube proxy, we can't have daemon sets, there's some things that just can't go out to it. So we have to taint it and then you just tolerate the deployment out to it, so. So is that scheduling it into I don't even know, like, is it going to oom um at some point? I mean, how many resources does it actually have? have. Yeah. So um, if you look at the, um, oh, let me show you. I just can't remember how to do this. Yeah, sorry, my Kubernetes skills have gotten a little bit, uh, a little bit rusty. So if I do a describe nodes, um, So the limits on this, those you're limited by subscription limits. So 10,000 nodes, oh sorry, four terabytes of RAM. Um, you can do GPUs uh, the, well, so these could be back, uh, ACI back GPUs. Um, and then 5,000 pods at least today, it looks like the, are the, the max. I think those can be increased with a support page, just like pretty much any, well, I don't think these are, I don't know that off the top of my head, so these, it might be hard limits, but usually these are fairly soft limits, at least the initial ones. But like, what are you getting billed for, I guess? Is that, you have no memory requests. So you're getting billed, you're getting billed for however many ACI instances per second that you're, that you're running. So if you go to five, you're paying for five of those per second. But it was based on request, your slide said request, yeah. But it's only, C the memory is pinned to the CPU, right? So you get a fixed amount of memory based on the number of CPUs you get. Is that right? Yeah. So you don't need to do you don't need to do a, a, a memory request right. because you do a CPU one that means your build for like the unit doesn't change based on memory. Right? So you just get some predetermined configuration. It rounds up the CPU to some bucket. To some bucket, and then you get charged based on that. Yeah. Sorry, I don't know. This is. Windows 10. That's I think I'm glad I, I'm not sure if I'm glad I switched to uh, Windows 10. <laughs> <laughs> this is recorded. Did I say, can we, can we cancel yeah. that last part? <laughs> <laughs> we had a these, remember? <laughs> okay, good. That's all done. Oh, well, I guess we don't. <laughs> um, so let me, uh, so that's that. Let me show you. And note that other configuration on how to. So if you if you want to have some nodes and the images are cached and it's faster, kind of uh, it's like someone said back there, you can create a uh, uh, admission controller webhook that would then uh, insert the toleration um, and then also during scheduling it would actually um, be deployed to the nodes and then during burst capability it would actually go to ACI. So that's how you can do the. That's how you can do that. Um, or you can just have the appendices to all your specs yourself. Though. Or you can do it. Or you can do it just. It's a lazy, yeah, yeah, lazy man's way, right? So if you wanted to do that, we've got a Helm chart to do that. Um, and then you just, the last thing you have to do is just label. Um, is it, uh, the label, the name, yeah, thank you, the namespace with something so it knows to push that um, controller to. So here's the. Um, 
here's the providers that are, that are, that are helping us with this currently today. So um, obviously us, Amazon, Alibaba. It, it was funny, I was looking at their container instance name and it's Elastic Container Instance. I'm like, wait a minute, that sounds like a, more of an Amazon thing, but it is what it is. And then there's the Zune, yes, and I don't know what the VMware and the other stuff is, but that's some of the contributors so far. Um, I'll share this deck uh, all with you guys if you want it, and then there's just some links here if you want to go watch Brendan talk more about it on Azure Fridays, and then Sean McKenna, who's another uh, PM on AKS, talk about it as well. If you guys want to contribute, again, it's open source on GitHub under uh, Virtual Kubelet. Happy to have any of you. It's all written in Go, so anybody that wants to do that. Uh, so the, any, any, oh, back to your Paul, I actually don't know how we're um, securing that. That's, that's a good, really good question. Um, now, at least on the IoT stuff, right? I mean, I think I know how we're doing that with inside of Azure and things like that, but as you reach out to the edge, I'm not sure what the security um, parameters are, yes, what, what risks you're, you take by doing that. It's like, just talking back to master over the API, so it's, it's got a token, it's got HTTPS, it's, it's, not, it's, but it's just the but same thing. it doesn't thing. live on the edge, so your edge is just where you're you're executing. Yeah. The virtual kubelet is like the interface between them. So it's the thing that says, oh, you wanted this process. Let me go call some API to get it to exist in some place. And its job, so its interface with the API server is just that small part. It doesn't have to like spread it all the way to the edge. Most of the times it's not. It's more like, oh, I wanted to turn this in uh, at KubeCon. They did one and he just used Bash. He like just started running processes on his laptop as a virtual kubelet. And so it doesn't have most of the things you would expect from a Kubernetes orchestrated process. And it has the ability to just run it wherever you want it instead. Interesting. Does the manifest come through and then you just honor what you want to honor? Yeah. So like when you saw his talk about an operator and it's yeah. like this stub thing and you fill in these five methods, that's virtual kubelet. It's like you fill in the five methods that it cares about, about how to take a pod spec and schedule it into a place. And most of the time, half the stuff that used to be there for a pod, you're not going to care about because you're just going to run a process on your laptop or whatever you were. Interesting. And the networking, again, is... So what I, what I heard um, from one of our PMs on the networking is that uh, since we can't, it's, there's not a real node there, um, we actually sidecar Kube proxy with um, at least implementation one with your actual application. I was going to say, because you've got to be able to bridge or map or whatever you want to say it from the various areas. Um, so, do you, it, does, given that, then I guess there's no network policies that you could specify that this endpoint cannot talk to that endpoint like you could in, inside of a. I don't think that's supported today, yeah, with like network policy. I, I don't know if that's even on the roadmap, if that's yeah. something that we could prevent or. Not, I don't, yeah. I bet you it depends on the provider because if they're using it with like Fargate, then they boil down to Fargate tasks which have security groups like anything else. Right? You, it, it's becomes it's not Kubernetes like it won't obey your network, you know, your Calico or your Ciliums or whatever in Kubernetes, but you could do whatever. The, the, the L three though probably only. Yeah, probably probably just whatever the provider supports. Yeah. And different runtimes, I assume, or. Do you need a stalker at this point, or does it matter? So uh, it could be anything. It's a container runtime interface is supported too, just like on the website. Like you can do anything. You can throw it whatever you want or anything. Ashcorp and home. It, it's more about it's going to extract the entry point command yeah. and make it. So whatever the interface that you can play. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. I think I saw VMware's talk, and they were trying to get VMs or something. Would, like yeah. VMware was part of what the tooling is like to create your own. Like the operator tooling now is so incredible. This is brand new. <laughs> so there is some doc on the virtual kubelet site there there is uh, some wanted to actually create your own yeah. steps on how to actually start going through that I don't, I don't think there's as much of a reconciliation process you have to do some monitoring of the thing you were like there's still concepts still like some checks and, and yeah. whatnot maybe <laughs> but outside of that it's not like you have to deal with this complex of stuff yeah and it's more about like what, what what apis did you have so that's why it's building onto aci and it's just like wired into all the aci things so so given that how does the logging work how do you get the, the logging back from the process so i try and now i, I try to um uh 
when I was logged, when I was trying to figure out, I had some issues right at the beginning uh, when I was setting this up, but I had to log. Um, I couldn't get logs out of the, the containers. For, I don't know why. You can't do keep control log. I, I would, nothing came up like, uh, so I don't know if it, it was. It has to support it. Yeah, it, 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 doesn't it may be that it's just not it. in the version currently. Like there, there's definitely an API call that's being made to a kubelet. Yeah, yeah. They just it's haven't patched it into. Yeah. yeah. So I'm just wondering if you have that process running outside, like you're saying. You would need API some sort of like extra logging. Virtual cube so goes to wherever you think. I think a lot of this is you're, you're opting into the parts you want. And if you're running over the you might not actually want sure. that version of logging. Maybe you have something else, or maybe you just don't log at all. Like this. Huh. Interesting. <laughs> the troubleshoot, I actually had to go to deployed ACI connector, figure out why, and there was something wrong with my limits and stuff, and so I was able to get stuff on why it couldn't deploy, but as far as what the app was doing, I wasn't able to get many logs from it, so yeah, I don't know if that's, I'll have to check and see if it's a rolling up item. Cool. Um, do you know what's different between ACI and Fargate? I don't. Yeah, I'm not sure how it can, but you might. You might Fargate, well, the one thing that first comes to mind is Fargate has per second billing after put a minimum, a minute minimum, so it's not as good as it sounds like for really, really short-lived tasks because you can have you know a 10-second task take a minute and then that adds up really, really quickly. I know because we are trying to figure out how to do really, really short-lived tasks and it doesn't work. So maybe, I don't know if that's the same there. I think ours is actually to the second, but I don't know if they have some, I'm sure they have features we don't and we might have some data, but yeah, I'm not, I can't really speak to differences. But I mean, if it, it takes 30 seconds to spin up, then you're, Per second overhead, yeah, for, and trying to you run. Pay for that in Fargate too. So I, I mean, I assume you pay for that here. Like as soon as the, the task right. shows, whether it's running or not, as soon as you've submitted the thing, and it says I'm creating it, you're paying for it, right? And there was no, again, no guarantees about like image caches and that kind of stuff in either place. So I think they're actually comparable in what they, that they in that neither. I'm just saying it seems much. like a 10 second job is a terrible idea because you're right. in 3x the overhead. Yeah. You probably want it a little bit longer than that. Too. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. I mean, it depends. Some on, minimum. It depends on you know how long you have to keep a node up to run that 10 second job, right? Like if you had to keep a node just for that job, then it might not. Be. I know there's been some conversation of actually pre-caching a bunch of stuff actually out in CI, so that when you come with a fairly standard base image, that it loads a lot faster than waiting 30 seconds. So less less overhead. But obviously, we didn't see that tonight. So <laughs> there's at least 30 seconds. Sorry. Is fine. I like that we're at the point in our cloud now where we're like, it took more than 30 seconds. 30 seconds for us. Yeah, like, forever. It's unusable. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. Job out to the yeah. So let me show you some of the projects that we've been working on as, as at Microsoft um, and contributing to. Some we are ours, some are, well, most of these are ours actually. Um, Helm 3 came out. If you any Helm users in here? No more tiller yeah. on the Woo! cluster and our back and all the security concerns around too little, too late. That's good. Helm's <laughs> 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 great when you pair it with Argo. Uh, the VS Code Kubernetes extensions, do you guys use those at all? <clears throat> Fantastic. I don't know. Yeah, they're great. I didn't realize that was there because it says it right there. It's my the virtual Kubelet, obviously. <laughs> and then the service mesh interface. I don't know. We seem to be getting a fair amount of traffic here because there's so much complexity with every service mesh that you go to, and every one is so different. You um, guys are helping build that spec? Yeah, that was actually from, from us, from oh, okay. Brandon and T. Yeah. So we're hoping that everybody. I have prototypes using it with, with uh, Link32. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Yeah, does it work? Like, it does. It does. I mean, it doesn't. It doesn't have all my needs yet. Like, I need. Like, it has a. It has a good canary testing. But we want to do things where we only like header-based routing. Like, that's not there yet. Right. And I, there's a bunch of tickets open for it. And I'm sure it'll eventually come in. But yeah, no, that's awesome. I know there was some pushback from, from Tim Hawken <laughs> from Google on that. He didn't like it. Um, but it seems like overall, most of the community likes a, a kind of a standard interface that you call and. Can get something from any of the back. Oh, he didn't like the there. spec at all. Is that exactly. what you're he didn't like the spec at all, or he didn't like he didn't like header based. There was him and him and Brendan kind of got into it because Brendan was like, "Yeah, we need to do the the mesh," and he's like, "No, we don't need to standardize on this." So I don't know exactly. I just heard there was some kind of feuding. I don't, I don't feel like I'm locked in, right? Like, ah, this one's not working. I'll switch over to the crappy HDO or yeah. <laughs> talking about T-Bot. 
cost a thousand dollars. Yes, yes, uh, actual function, function is not is it not here? Is that not um so just have not because I was actually really impressed with that. I look I'm looking at Kata here. I went to the talk at KubeCon that was Kata and Azure Functions. Oh yeah. I thought Azure Functions was actually the cooler part of that talk. Yeah. Yeah. So Kata, yeah, the ability to um, leverage um, I actually don't know. Kata is like Q depth based scale, right? So rather than worry about like and restarting scaling based on invocations, you scale based on your backlog of things on a queue, which right. is what I would actually. Yeah. I don't have a slide on that, but was there? Do you have adoption on any of those? Like I, I'd never heard of Duffel before. Does so, so there's some new projects like um, Duffel and uh, what was it? CNAB. <laughs> uh, CNAB is rolling into two projects that we just released called Rudder and Dapper. So when that comes up, I'll show you some slides on that. Oh, and the whole idea on... Finally, we do it. Oh, from Day Slabs. Well, let's remember you're talking about adoption and like... I'm just curious. In the Kubernetes world, we're like JavaScripters. There's a new thing. I know, it's so fun. <laughs> Wait a week. We'll see if adoption's there. I don't know. <laughs> see how long this takes. Sorry. If you have two people use it, it's it's, uh, it's it's basically a standard at that point. Are you using Open Policy Agent for anything? Like in in Azure, Azure, Azure KS yeah. itself. Yeah, yeah there's some. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Like security. So they bracketed it. You're you're an Azure user. user. Was 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 an Azure <laughs> user. Uh, so <laughs> integration with Open Policy Agent and Azure Security Center to be able to kind of configure. So it's not like I am or Security Center or something else. It's just our kind of overall security platform in Azure, but there will be some features to where you can use that to, you know, configure with the Open Policy Agent. So we also have some other stuff like policies within Security Center to where we can say only trust. <laughs> Um, when you deploy a cluster, only trust um, images from this repo, only, you know, things like that. <clears throat> All right. Can you give me a job at Days Labs? You want a new job, Clint? At Days? Well, at Days. Days for sure. This place is awesome. Is so game still there? It is. They, like, roll all the well, Good Days Labs, Labs got rolled into us, right? Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, Gabe's still there. He actually was in Boulder and moved to Seattle. Oh, yeah. um, so, let me... Try this again. I hope it doesn't reboot on me. Maybe your microphone picked up what you said, your transparency about Fargate. <laughs> and it's like, nope, we're rebooting this guy. <laughs> Shut up and down. Shut up and down. <laughs> All right. What's that on a task? Hopefully it worked. Okay. So this we already talked about this. The service mesh interface. Um, run any mesh on the back end. Um, this one. Let's see. So this one is the. What is this one? Sorry. And this yes. is. Yeah. So this is um, Dapper. This is the ability to. Make it easier for a dev to say, you know, CRD. now if you run yeah, right. you know, services in Kubernetes like a database service and, and you don't want to be locked in, I still think if you're in any cloud, you're locked in. But um, if you want to say, I need an AWS SQS or I need a GCP, I don't know, Pub Sub, or a, um, Service Bus or Event Hub, you can just call a simple statement in your code. It calls a sidecar, which is Dapper, which then provisions that. You know, it brings it in for you. So you don't have to like pull in the SDK, figure out how it all works, right? You know, get it all into your code, essentially just call a sidecar. Um, and then that's for the bindings. And then if you need state stores like a database, there's also um, some, some configuration, simple Wi-Fi configuration for that, and then PubSub um, service bus configuration for that as well. But the idea is to make it easy for the developer to not have to get, put all these SDKs in, figure out how they all work, and just simply make a an HTTP or a, or a GR, uh, GPRC, <laughs> uh, G, GRPC call and have that configured for you. So that's Dapper. And then Rudder is, um, so that's, uh, is, the, is kind of the idea of making a, kind of a single, so I don't know how you guys feel like with, we well, have a deployment, you have a service, you have an ingress, you have a, 
policy, network policy, you have all these manifests all over the place. But so the ability to create a single configuration file that then actually goes and, and does all of this stuff before you on, uh, for you on the back end. And that's, um, so it's, there's actually this model out there today called the open, open application model, but in our implementation of that is, is Rudder. So you could go look at it to see what you think of it. I like that. I mean, because that's for the, like the 90% of people that deploy a thing and aren't doing weird stuff. And why should I make 10 files to leverage all the flexibility that I don't need? Right, right. It's just, yeah, like, learning how to get that pipeline. Um, so that's that. Um, <coughs> will anybody use GitHub Actions at all in here? A few of you? Okay. So if you've used our Azure DevOps platform, we have this concept of pipelines, build and release pipelines. Where that came from, we've taken those and we've actually ported that into GitHub as um, uh, GitHub Actions. So what you're actually using there behind the scenes is uh, Azure DevOps uh, pipelines. But cool. nice way to, for CICD right inside of, of GitHub. And I'll just... Uh, oh, yeah, because you guys don't GitHub now. We want to get that's that. right. That's a deep. <laughs> this is Kate. This one I'm actually not as familiar with. You the Microsoft uh, talk on it. Yeah, it was a great. It was a really great talk. It's kind of a cool idea. A different kind of auto scaling, right? Yeah, different kind of auto scaling, leveraging Azure uh, functions. So or anything, it actually will scale any deployment. Okay. So you, uh, you know more about it than I. <laughs> I liked it. I it was really fun. Um, another one that we've worked on is if you if you leverage Azure and leverage Azure Active Directory, which a lot of our customers do, instead of creating service accounts in etcd and having another identity that you're managing all this, we've taken um, an integrated Azure Active Directory into um, <coughs> sorry into Kubernetes RBAC. So I can have the four of us in a group, and we can have access to a namespace and do whatever you know read, get, on the, uh, whatever actions it is. And now that you're part of that group, I can go to the kubectl, and I just see that namespace. You don't have to worry about etcd. You don't have to worry about service accounts. It's all uh, Azure. So that's pretty nice. What, what tool is that? Here? What's that? What tool is that? Here? Well, what tool is it in? Which open source project is that thing a part of? Well, that's not. That is not. Right. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to open source all of our Azure Active Directory. Yeah. I'm like, wait, did he do? Yeah, that's a good that question. Is that like only in like an ACI cluster or ACR cluster, or whatever it's called? No, it's just it's mainly for for AKS. Um, so you, this one is kind of AKS um, specific, where most of these others, well, and yeah, most of these others are all kind of open source. Yeah, this one's our own. So, does this also work like for service accounts, like cube to IM or um, work with identities to Google? Is that the one you? Is that the one you wrote? I didn't know. Or I didn't write it, but I contributed to that. That's right. <laughs> this, is the, this is the same as the like the helper tool, plugin tools for Amazon or for Google or any like it's all the same. Just helper plugin for authentication into it. Well, Look what I'm asking no, if it's that, that user only or if it's also service account. Yeah. Uh, it could be per pod access to cloud resources. Yeah, like this, this, the main thing for this one was, um, I don't know, not so much like that, that a pod, I think we have that to where a pod can run as a certain identity. This one more is, this feature though is more for when you um, just kubectl integration with Azure Active Directory, things like that. A um, couple more, we about, about good on time, Paul. Yeah. So this one is, uh, we call it Azure Monitor for Containers. Uh, again, this one you have to be in, in Azure. Um, but this one is, we actually don't need a Prometheus server anymore. So we, so you can actually go and scrape um, Azure Monitor for containers can go and scrape endpoints and it becomes kind of your Prometheus server itself. And so then you can then use Lightning. So it uses Lightning. the same annotations. Yep. Yep. We, we had too many customers like, we need to run Prometheus, we need to run Prometheus. And so now I'm just going to that into um, Azure Monitor for containers. So it's nice. I think um, there's anyway some things here that. Looks like you can let us know if any issues are testing or whatever. 
That's pretty much it. Like, so I can pay you other, <laughs> that's fine. Like, sponsor me. Any other questions? For everybody. So just a quick <clears throat> on this virtual cubelet back on that. Where do you see it going? I mean, you, you must have some vision inside of Microsoft as well as everybody else, but do you, do you feel it's like you were saying at the beginning that it's it's kind of the, the way of bringing people in to these this world, or do you think it's a new world? Uh, I think it's a bit of both. I think it's a bit of bringing people in. You guys know it again, and you know it, but there's so many customers that are legacy that are just getting on that bandwagon. And so for them, I think it will be easier not to have to deal with any VMs and Node auto, not auto, Node auto scalers and all of that. It still seems compelling though to have it like does. functions as a service. Like right. if one sees the same manifest to deploy it, you don't have to think about it. They ever use the same infrastructure, you just hit it as if it was there. Yeah. And you don't no one has to think about it except for like SRE team. Well, it's like the old, old sure. sidestep for scale for auto scaling. Like how do you auto scale enough? Yeah. yeah. You don't. Yeah. You just, right? just like, there. I mean, isn't it just yeah. a big pool of VMs anyway? But all, I mean, yeah, you just don't see a share there. It's whatever managed. Right. It's managed scaling. But as far as but the other thing I was going to say is where I see us going in different directions is because of the plug, uh, how pluggable it is, just different use cases like IoT. And, mm -hmm. and I mean, the IoT is the one that we currently have at the moment. But there could, I mean, you could, sky's the limit for this one, right? Yeah. Run it wherever you want to run it. I can't think of a specific use case, but I love the idea of using the pod scheduling mechanisms and doing my own, and yeah. running the Kubernetes API and running pods that aren't really pods where I'm just using all those hooks to do more interesting things yeah. that aren't containers. But, but as, as far as the service, ingress, all that stuff, that all plays <laughs> somehow in getting it exposed as an endpoint? Yeah, so you can, um, you can put, these actually were behind, um, sitting behind a load balancer, so okay. that actually works. Um, I think one of the, since we have VNet integration, there's some more networking capabilities we got with that. There might be some, I don't think, there shouldn't be any um, limitations with ingress that I can think of. I was just wondering if you were going to do TLS termination, or if you had to go all the way to the pod, term, you know, with the search. Hopefully you terminate, well, I guess it depends on your security policy. Hopefully you terminate at the ingress and then, yeah. But I guess that depends if you're going all the way to an edge device or right. what your security, yeah, I, don't, I don't know. I don't have all the answers. This is, is fairly new, but I, I, I like the idea of just non-infrastructure, right? Yeah. Just, I, I don't know. Well, it did really seem like, so you can write operators for databases and operators for caches and all this stuff. If the thing you're writing an operator for looks like a pod spec, this is now probably the direction that a lot of that moves. Yeah. So that you're scheduling, yeah. if you're scheduling on a old mainframe and it looks like a process and it has a resource constraint and all that, you can still do it with operators, but this gets it to a different level where now you can manage it a little. Yeah. yeah. Or resources that just can't exist well in Kubernetes at all. Yeah. There's plenty of them, but you want them to be accessible easily. So just an adapter to I mean, I'm guessing you could support RBAC, you could support network policy up until the it's proxy or wherever. It's pretty interesting. So it's the second use case of the Kubelet API is what it really is. Yeah. Kubelet used to just be like, I'm going to run pods and Docker, yeah. maybe have like a few layers of a right. runtime underneath it. Yeah. Now that level of the interface is is getting its second track. Yeah. Which I think interesting. Yeah. Like a certain database things that you don't, you can't run in Kubernetes or we yeah. don't want it. That's very really cool. So hopefully, yeah, I hope um, we see it continue to grow. We'll, we'll see. We need some updates this week. <laughs> Got a new hammer. I'm sure everything will fit in the hammer. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember what the hammer is doing. I'm pretty but. sure this is for virtual people that solves this problem. <laughs> so what it is is you have a company like VMware that's invested so much in their platform that they they have their hammer. Yeah, yeah. There we go. <laughs> Our answer is just going to be: Have you looked at the virtual cube? <laughs> yeah. 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 So Honestly, if it was a VM that interface with it yeah. as a pod, I'd be fine with that. Like, I would be absolutely <laughs> really happy with just the pod, but it happens to be a VM. Be a VM and you say security solved, right? People are worried. I mean, about the entry point could just be. So you, the slide you were showing. Exactly, literally, could just be. Right? Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, th so this is our, the virtual node is our implementation of the virtual cubelet yeah. inside of Azure APIs. But uh, Fargate has an offering. Okay. I'm guessing Google will have something too. It's a, a virtual dash cubelet. So, so we can plug it into our, our Kubernetes. Yeah, you could even write your own want or uh, yeah. what do you guys use on-prem Kubernetes? Or? No, we're running it in Azure, but we okay. did it ourselves. And so, yeah, so you could just le leverage this, turn it on, and start using that today. Um, we looked at that. I think the major part is the networking. So because you're going outside the, the like, CNI doesn't exist on the other side sometimes, you have to make sure that in Azure, you'd have to be using their CNI for it to work. Yeah, so yeah, you're you launching a different network right. than... <laughs> so we have two networking models in AKS. You're probably familiar with them. The uh, KubeNet, which is just the basic Kubernetes networking. And then you can use our plugin, which is the Azure CNI. Uh, every pod gets its IP. And we actually have to have a dedicated subnet for um, ACI to integrate with um, uh, the virtual. The virtual. So, as long as you can dedicate a subnet to us, then you're good. So. I think some of the like the smaller, like hyper.sh or some of those have <laughs> Virtual Kubelet integration. Yeah, actually, Hyper was the one I think we originally worked with on this, um, or partnered with, or something. So I, I know they definitely have it there. Uh, as a service, uh, so you can manage those. They're gone now, right? You know, so when you run shut down, I think so. Not on Azure Container Interface question. So when you run a container, is it on a VM, or you've got container infrastructure? Sort of like the um, Gvisor. No, what's the, Azure Amazon's one? That they, they run in Firecracker. Yeah, it's, it's like is Firecracker. a Firecracker situation where it's a container, but it's hypervisor isolation. It's, it's not a shared kernel, is my understanding. Yeah, it's a, that's, yeah no, I think no, it's the first one not shared. you said not a shared kernel. Not it's, shared. it's hyper. It's Firecracker esque in that it's a very lightweight VM built on Hyper V. That like no Hyper V. Yeah, what do they call it? Yeah, like a little slim down. But it's it's not actually available to anything but. Azure. It's not like you can go run it on your own like you could try with the Firecracker. Yeah, like you could try with Firecracker. <laughs> cool. Okay, that was yeah, my question. That was a good question. Were you controlling DevOps? Because if I'm not controlling my own nodes, there's a lot of silly stuff you can do with Kubernetes models that you can try to break out. Like, oh, like, oh, like, oh, like, Anything else? Oh, oh socks. Don't need socks. Yeah, switch over to Teams from Slack if you want. My wife uses Teams all the time. Okay. I got that. What's some questions? Um, true or false? Oh, there we go. Uh, Is it cube? True, true or false? No, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, true or false? Uh, container instances are per minute. False. 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 Second. Um, <laughs> Oh, we got good. Thanks. I suck at coming up with questions like this. Paul Quiz. I only, Paul's pretty I only have one wife. Something that you. I have one wife. I'll throw the, I'll throw the socks. Yeah. I got my weave socks. I don't need. What did you? What did you? What did you get from this? Um, boy. What, what new features does Helm three? Oh yeah. Does Helm three bring? To Who would use Helm three? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sucks. Who was that, Clint? Well, I know me. I'm not using it. Oh. <laughs> Josh. <laughs> that Josh. Is it? I mean, if it no. solves the problem, it might be fine. I'll, I'll use it once. No tiller for other tools. No tiller. No tiller. No tiller. No tiller. No tiller. <laughs> oh. We got three more. We got three more pairs. They're comfy. <laughs> Extra ins. <laughs> Teals. That one. Um, let's see. That was his question. Oh, <laughs> uh, let's uh, let's see another question. Um, What's, uh, Can you stop your Windows machine from restarting? All right, two more pairs. Paul, what'd you learn? What's something you learned that you can ask? Me? Um, uh, what's the networking model for the virtual keyboard? What, so, what, what, what do you have to have for the in Azure for the? Yeah. Um, Enable the virtual um, networking model, the virtual node networking model. Yeah. Just one thing. Just one. What's the name of the 
the plugin, the network plugin. Okay. KubeNet was the wrong one. KubeNet was the wrong one. <laughs> Close. Has your network seen your face? Has your network seen your face? I can't. Yeah, something like that. Fancy. Uh, uh, Whatever. <laughs> Nobody did that. You guys heard that one. I did. They got it. What? Oh, they got it? <laughs> yeah. I said Azure networking blah blah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was me, man. Good enough. Good enough. Good enough. Good enough. Good enough. Team, take the sock. Take the sock, man. Good job, team. Uh, let's see. Who in Microsoft came up with the virtual cubelet uh, idea? Steve Brandon Burns. Brandon. 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 Oh, the guy that was on. Oh, nice. All right. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. Thank you.